Um, I'm pleased to introduce our speaker today, Roxana Radu from the Stein Eye Institute, which is my home institution. That's where I did my residency uh, many, many years ago. And uh, Roxana and I go back a very long way. Um, we both, and we share common interests. We both, when we both, Roxana started out as an MD and she uh, grew up in, or she was trained in Romania. And she came here in the mid 1990s and she was not an ophthalmologist. And just like I was not, I had no idea I was gonna go into ophthalmology, but I was put into a, uh, on a project on the visual cycle. And that's exactly what she was, did, which, what happened to her when she came to Texas at UT Southwestern. And obviously the visual cycle is a great, great area to be studying and she's been very, very productive. She was at UT Southwestern working mainly with Gabriel Travis there. And when uh, he moved to UCLA, in, so she came in the mid 1990s, in the early 2000s, she went to UCLA with him. And she, even though uh, she, didn't have, she doesn't have a PhD, she learned how to do research and learn from the ground up. And eventually it was publishing in very, very high profile journals like Neuron and PNAS and has done very, very well, and now has an R01 and her own independent laboratory. She's going to be talking today about complement dysregulation and the link with Stargardt disease and age-related macular degeneration. And I'm very happy to have the clinicians here and to also have the basic scientists who think so much of her that they actually did get up at 8 o'clock in the morning to be here. So, Roxana. Uh, thank you very much, Paul, for the kind introduction, and uh, I am truly honored to be here at Moran Eye Center and uh, visited, the, visiting the center and also have this incredible opportunity to share with you data that we uh, generate in our laboratory. And um, <clears throat> uh, looking forward to meet some of you today and tomorrow. So today, I'll be talking about complement dysregulation as a possible link between Stargardt disease and age-related macular degeneration. So how many of you have heard that complement system is dysregulated in Stargardt? Mm, some. Okay. I certainly hope at the end of this talk, everyone will um, consider this um, uh, pathogenic pathway that does play a role in Stargardt. And... Um, um, although both AMD and Stargardt disease have multiple cellular targets that includes, um, of course, photoreceptor, retinal pigment epithelium, Brooks membrane, and choroid capillary, for today's talk, majority of the um, study that we've implemented was to focus on pathophysiology of the uh, retinal pigment epithelium. This is heavily studied in the past, as uh, um, uh, Paul alluded, because uh, I've been implicated in um, evaluated multiple function of this um, retinal pigment epithelium. This is the outermost layer of the retina. It contributes to formation of the blood retinal barrier by um, formation of those tight junction. Um, and allows um, selective trafficking of all sorts of solute, solutes, uh, uh, ions, um, glucose, uh, vitamin A, from the basal lateral to the apical side. They are, um, they are polarized cells, uh, and this apical microvilli of the RPE have a very intimate connection with the outer segment of the photoreceptor, and by doing so, they also participate in uh, daily phagocytosis that allows uh, regeneration of um, membranous disc of the photoreceptor, which are critical, contains the visual pigment and the molecules, life sensitive molecules that are needed for our vision. It also, RPE also secretes the growth factor necessary for both sides neural retina and also choroid capillaries, such as VGF and PDF. Um, as um, Paul mentioned, visual cycle is a key component in uh, RPE because RPE expresses major enzymatic protein that are um, essential in uh, regeneration of the um, visual chromophore 11 cis retinaldehyde. Also, um, due to the presence of melanin or other uh, non-visual opsin that I've been implicated, 
on my own as a postdoc with Gabe Travis, uh, studying retinal uh, G, uh, RP, RGR or RPE G protein cover receptors and peroxin. Um, they both modulate vitamin A metabolism in the RP, and that's also a, a function pretty critical. And you could imagine that any impairment of those function of the RP could mount uh, complement reactivity. And complement, and I'm pretty sure everybody here is aware it's our um, innate immune arm. We are born with this. So pretty much everything that goes wrong in a cell, in a body, will mount and complement reactivity. And it, it has numerous uh, biological function which I listed, opsonization, chemotaxis, agglutination, cell lysis, all with the goal of killing pathogen, from which cell lysis, I think, it's more dramatic. It's the one that, you know, has the ability to, to <clears throat> um, uh, build this membrane attack complex with the intention of, you know, break the pathogen membrane and open up the, in, um, the cell and release its content that leads to cell death. This uh, beautiful diagram, I'm not going to go through the steps. It's just to kind of uh, um, elucidate, uh, show you how this MAC is formed, uh, membrane attack complex is formed. It's um, a cascade activation starting um, um, through various pathways. And uh, Dr. Hegemann is the one who elucidated m most of them. Um, it could be a classical pathway, alternative pathway, lectin pathway, or an intrinsic pathway. But what they have in common um, um, is the, this stage where they form this um, C3 convertases, or C, uh, C3 convertases and C5 convertases that all have the um, powerful ability of... Um, lice molecules of complement that becomes more reactive and combine with other fragments to lead to this powerful C5B9 where other complement um, components get together. It is on all the time, as I said, and it's important to pre pre provide this powerful defense mechanism but it can also be detrimental to self-cell if it's amplified uh, over the normal level. So there is a constant sublytic uh, deposition at this level of membrane at a complex at the cellular level. But this uh, uh, complement, it's tightly regulated to avoid this pathological level where the, the host membrane can be um, um, damaged and lead to cellular deaths. So you have to imagine this MAC complex um, effect. It's like punching holes in the cellular membrane. All the cellular content is released and cell dies. So um, what is um, key for the retinal pigment epithelium is the fact that it expresses almost all the major cell surface, membrane-bound, and also fluid phase of those Regula complement regulatory protein. And this is literally um, similar as liver. <coughs> liver is the major organ that produces those complement regulatory protein to uh, be available to other cellular um, target. But in the case of RP, it does have this ability. And we analyze with Express other laboratory also shows data that they are present there. And um, that it's a key factor of the RP cells because it can defend itself without relying on the systemic uh, circulation um, uh, resource. And this is um, a beautiful image from uh, um, uh, eye donor of a um, woman, 86 years old, just to um, show you how strong immune reactivity um, uh, takes place at those cellular targets that are implicated in AMD. So in blue, it, RP, it's represented in blue. I'm trying to find it right here. And this 
Drews, it's the pathological hallmark for age-related macular degeneration. This particular individual didn't have any genetic background, it was just an HI, and uh, no complaints, basically, no <coughs> ocular pathology or a, a vision impairment, uh, unless, uh, but it shows that this activity is on all the time without really causing major problem. And despite this um, tremendous accumulation of those uh, complement um, molecules within this drusen, so drusen consists of cellular debris coming from different origin. It's photoreceptor, um, retinal pigment epithelium, Brooks membrane, choroid capillary. So all those debris mount or trigger this complement activation. And the end product is deposition of those fragments of complement that manifest spread mark and negative regulator or other regulators that also try to control this activation. And here in orange, you see the MAC deposit pretty much in the central area of the Druze and complement factory, which is a soluble form of um, soluble um, protein, um, complement regulatory protein that surround this MAC, suggesting that the RP constantly puts out this molecule to defend itself by this detrimental effect of MAC. Um, so what other um, knowledge we have from past study? Well, 2005 was a critical year. It's the year that um, there was this major discovery that mutation in complement factor H, which this discovery was made by Dr. Greg Hageman, and in parallel, three independent labs came up with the same uh, findings, um, made the news that there is a direct association with developing of the age-related macular degeneration. And that was quintessential. Since then, numerous study has actually shown that there are other mutation, um, other complement genes that shows mutation and shows association with AMD. Well, we also learned that Stargard carrier, so mutation in the gene responsible for Stargard, is a risk factor for AMD. So they start to sort from the genetic standpoint, there is another correlation. Clinically and pathologically, both diseases manifest with this central vision loss um, due to loss of cells in the macular region. There are no suitable models for AMD because AMD is not just genetics, age, there are other environmental factors, uh, smoking that contributes to this buildup. So it's hard to uh, model experimentally. There are models for Stargard disease. This is a monogenic disease. And uh, um, today, I'm going to go over several models that we generated or we um, obtained out from other places to investigate complement system in Stargard disease. So I'm going to uh, share with you some of the published and unpublished data using the Stargard mouse model, the ABC4 knockout mouse. And uh, I'm also going to share with you um, uh, part of the data that we, we rescued the ABCA4 phenotype because we also generated an albino mouse that um, in addition to biochemical phenotype that's been uh, um, uh, published initially when Dr. Travis generated this mouse, we back cross on an albino background and this particular ABCA4 knockout mouse has also photoreceptor degeneration. Then I'm going to show you some data using um, Stargard donor eyes, and that's from uh, collaborators of us in, uh, at Cleveland I, I Institute. And then we generated a Stargard in a dish model where we, um, we obtain fibroblasts uh, from uh, Stargard patients, and we um, rederive them in RPE. So um, just a brief background about Stargard disease. As I mentioned, it's caused uh, by a single gene, uh, mutation in a single gene, the ABCA4. It is the most common inherited juvenile macular degeneration. It affects about one in 10,000 individuals. Um, 
part of the clinical presentation, patients manifest with progressive central vision loss and delayed dark adaptation, and those manifestations are similar with uh, AMD. Um, as pathological markers, um, um, we, uh, Stargard presents with accumulation of autofluorescence uh, bisretinate lipofusion material in the RB. It has developing RP atrophy and photoreceptor degeneration. And this is just the topological model of ABCA4. So the gene encodes for a protein, which is an ATPase binding cassette um, uh, family member, type 4. And it's a cytoplasmic directly ATPase dependent flipase um, that uh, flips retinaldehyde. It's a form of vitamin A. Um, um, also condensed with the phospholipid, the phosphatidylethanolamine. So NRAP is the substrate for this protein ABCA4. More studies have shown that ABCA4 has no specificity for the substrate. It could flip 11 cis or all trans retinal uh, and retinal in uh, phosphatidylethanolamine. So um, ABCA4, um, it's been shown. So the gene was identified by Rendo Alikmets over 20 years ago, and Molde actually showed that the, the protein localizes on the rim of the membrane disk of the outer segment of photoreceptors. And our lab also recently shows that ABCA4 is also expressed in the RP cells in addition to photoreceptor, and that's quite new, and it does change the, the paradigm of pathogenesis of Stargard. And this part of the studies I'm going to present at the research seminar, so I will hopefully, if your time permits, I hope you join me because it does have a, um, significant clinical relevance in disease pathogenesis. And what I'm showing you here, this is a um, section of frozen uh, of fixed eye that came from the collection of Dr. Hageman. And it wasn't meant for RNA in situ hybridization with use of uh, specific probes against ABCA4. And as expected, um, the probe, every single dot, red dot, represent a molecule of RNA. So as expected, the uh, mRNA, it's present in the cell body of the photoreceptors. It's not present in the outer segment because the outer segment only contains the protein of that uh, mRNA. And it's also heavily expressed in the <clears throat> RP monolayer, as is shown here. Well, this is an H pigmented eye, so it's hard to see. But there is more data to show this um, evidence of RP later at noon seminar. So regardless, it's in the photoreceptor and RP, the lack or mutation in ABCA4 leads to buildup of these retinoids or dimers of vitamin A. And without going through all these uh, <clears throat> steps, the idea is all we need is aldehyde, and it can be in form of all transretinal aldehyde as shown here, bind with, and, uh, with phosphatidylethanolamine. And this is the first reaction, which is irreversible, reversible, form NRP. And in excess of other aldehydes, 11 cis all trans or any kind of aldehydes, condensation to the sun red P, a second, con a second molecule of aldehyde condensing with N red P, um, give rise to this dimers form. So there are various forms of this dimer depending on their, their composition of having or not having the fatty acid uh, included. And in um, upon Phagocytosis, those components are released in the RP, so RP has to deal and further process some of them and form this A2E. And I think that's the most um, abundant fluorophore because this, these retinates also have property of autofluorescent. And depending on their um, absorption spectrum, more or less, you're going to visualize them in a, uh, in a living eye as well. Giving their chemical composition, they're not um, final compounds because they all have this double bond along uh, double bonds along the polyene chain, and those double bonds can oxidize, and that gives rise to a series of 
totally more reactive or they can fragment and that also become more, more reactive. It's hard to monitor them. What I'm showing you here, every single compound, we can analyze on a, com like a normal phase liquid chromatography. But the oxidized form of this dimers of vitamin A could only be analyzed using a mass spec where you have a particular developed method for the individual one. And it's hard to control this level of oxidation. <clears throat> so consequences in a <coughs> mouse model, the ABCA4, the Stargard model, ABCA4, with age, they build up this uh, components. And what I'm showing here is the ATE and the immediate major precursor of ATE. ATE stands from two molecules of all transretinal aldehyde bound with ethanolamine. Um, what's interesting, a wild type I also increased this dimerized form. So with aging, we have processing of this vitamin A in the RPE that are not really clear out, so wild type also accumulates those. So this is sort of the image coming from a living eye. And what I'm showing you here from study of Frischke et al, um, uh, found this uh, autofluorescence of a Stargard patient top images and uh, um, geographic atrophy AMD patient um, at the bottom. So I mentioned that those these retinates have property of autofluorescence and here, uh, this massive um, uh, bright autofluorescence granulus kind of um, accumulates along the edge of the um, atrophic lesion. Both um, patients turn to have mutation in ABC4 genes. None of these patients have mutation in the complement genes. However, I'm going to show you later that complement is regulated in such case. So how do we know those uh, material, autofluorescent material in a human eye contains these retinoids? Well, we had the opportunity to obtain some tissue from Stargard eyes, and what I'm showing you is our representative chromatogram of um, uh, normal um, uh, sample and two um, uh, different Stargard patients. So we extract the bisretinoids and analyze by um, HPLC. And uh, you could easily um, estimate that the normal eye has very um, uh, low, uh, um, high, lower abundance of ATE the, compared to the uh, Stargard individual that the peak height is much higher. And the insert actually shows the specific spectra for A3 in blue and um, the precursor of A3 in red. So what else we know about complements? So this Dr. Sparrow Labs have done incredible um, um, amount of uh, work in um, evaluating the effect of the bisretinates and oxidative form of bisretinates on complement. And most of those studies were done in vitro um, in stimulating different um, cell um, type loaded with those components. We also evaluated the effect of bisretinates in the mouse tissue, and I'm going to show you some of those evidence. But we had a seminal study a while ago where we show that the activation of the complement in um, uh, by these retinoids it's direct dependent on the genotype of the RPE cells. So in other words, not only that activation was done via the alternative pathway, I'm not going to show you the data that's been published, but it's clearly that the AMD complement factor is risk haplotype cannot defend itself properly when it's um, uh, challenged with the outer segment containing the species retinates. So that was um, uh, I, a seminal study that told us the cells over time, you know, being on this predisposing um, uh, background, cannot really mount a proper regulatory um, 
reaction. So here we move towards what evidence do we have for complement dysregulation in Stardart mouse model. So this was also done uh, several years ago. Um, and started very simple. We learned about complement system in 2005. We learned about this uh, clinical um, similarity in Stardart and AMD. And I was like, okay, if we know that this piece retinoids stimulates complement, then we ought to find evidence uh, by looking at complement-specific protein. And what I'm showing you here, these are um, confocal images of suction of retina, where we use an antibody against C3 fragments. Actually, those were specific for the fragments, but we use antibody that uh, can visualize the, the uh, whole <coughs> length of the protein. But the fact that the whole um, thickness of the RP lit up suggested that all this uh, activation of the complement that normally takes place on the plasma membrane are internalized, further contributing to you know, pile up or debris that are toxic or not really um, uh, normal. And they do um, co-localize with autofluorescence, which autofluorescence is sort of a marker for um, these retinoid lipofusions. In the wild type, however, the level of the complement uh, fragment internalization is more. It wasn't surprising, the internalization, because I have to remind you, RPE is a phagocytic cell. It's not only phagocytose outer segment, but it also internalizes uh, fragments from the basal lateral, and that is one of the defensive mechanisms of um, the cells. Well, we further um, um, test for MAP production in this, and what I'm showing you are representative confocal images of the RPE flat mounts of the wall type on the left and ABC for knockout on the right. And here, I hope you could um, appreciate a significant more deposition of this map, MAC on the RPE cells of the knockout. And surprisingly, despite this um, massive complement activation and deposition of MAC, the negative regulatory protein um, in, uh, in the mouse, starter mouse, are down-regulated. So that was puzzling to us because we would have ex expected that the RP is going to express higher level to counteract this aberrant activation of uh, uh, complement pathway. And the only explanation we had at that time was well, maybe that it's a reflection of RPE declining in providing the necessary um, uh, protein to defend itself. So over time, this is just contributing to the pathogenesis or changes that we've seen over time in this uh, particular um, cell. And of course, we confirm by protein amount that those are truly um, um, lower in the knockout mouse. And mouse has a duplication in the gene, DAF1. It's a um, homologue of uh, CD45. Um, and CRRY, it's actually a homologue of human uh, complement receptor 1. So with this um, data, we decided to take um, ask the question, is this complement dysregulation in the starter mouse pathogenic. So in other words, is that an independent pathway that takes place in the RP and the side of the gene defect, this just contributes further to damage of the cell. And one way to address that was, can, uh, um, can we upregulate negative regulatory protein in the RP and rescue the photoreceptor um, degeneration in this mouse? and perhaps, you know, create a much healthier or pro um, promote healthiness of the RP, I would say. So how did we do that? So we choose the CRRY, the CR1 uh, homolog, human homolog, because it acts much early in the complement cascade, so not really building up all this sort of uh, full cascade of mounting MAC. And we also tagged the protein with NIC because we wanted to distinguish between the endogenous 
um, protein and um, visualized by immunofluorescence. And here I'm showing you on top um, section uh, the um, experiments with the antibody against snake and the um, AAV injected mice. This was a single injection at four weeks and we monitored the mice up to one year. And we showed that the um, expression of MIGTAC protein is specifically in the RPE. And when we um, use an antibody against C3, and this is full lens and it also uh, can uh, identify fragments of C3 protein, it's significantly lower. But this was qualitative images. We did quantitative immunoblot and showed that there is a, a, a significant reduction in the deposition of those C3 in the RP. And here it's not biased. It's the um, injection was subretinally. We usually, uh, in our hands, um, 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 transduce about anywhere between 40 to 65%. But there is also diffusion. And as I said, this is bias. We use the whole eye, homogenized and subject to this type of analysis. So um, surprisingly, when we um, extracted base retinoids and analyzed by um, uh, HPLC, we, we also noticed significant reduction in these retinoids in the uh, CRRY injected mice compared to the null injected. So that was the appropriate control for that. And the interpretation we had, okay, so that means the fact that we reduce the burden of RPE with the complement fragments, the RPE may recycle or clear out those piece retinas. So that speaks towards healthiness and much more robust activity of the RPE functions. And that's consistent with uh, quantification of the lipofusion granules, and uh, they are um, uh, uh, pointed by the uh, yellow arrows. And also some rescue of the photoreceptor cell. And this quantification of the photoreceptor cells were done in the region that we knew the cells, uh, uh, RP cells were transduced. And in that region, the number of photoreceptors actually matched the number of a wild-type mouse. So that was quite uh, um, um, important finding that not addressing the gene defect, but just dealing with the complement dysregulation in the RPE and lower the burden of complement fragments and activation can um, partially rescue the phenotype of the RP. So the data clearly slow C3 activation, it's protective against complement attack, um, and preservation of the photoreceptor it's shown. So overall, the RP it's healthier. So <coughs> is complement dysregulated also seen in patients with Stargard? And here we, um, we had about, we had four, um, I um, donor eyes from Stargard patients. They've been clinically diagnosed, diagnosed as Stargard, and the, some of them were genotyped for ABCA4. Some could not be genotyped because the tissue was fixed, so pretty much all we can do with this eye is just um, evaluate the complement system using biochemical approaches. So this is um, the first eye we had, and it was fully characterized by our um, collaborator, um, Dr. Bonilla. Um, and um, we specifically asked um, from her to provide tissue from two regions, the perimacular region and peripheral region, because to assess the complement reactivity in the RP, we needed to have RP cells. If we go to an atrophic region, it doesn't tell us anything. And I'm gonna show you some um, experiments from both regions and to do quantification, all the quantification was done from the peripheral area. And we also confirmed, so we got the T, um, um, 
blocks for electron microscope and we did suction from the peripheral area to ensure that that regions have still an intact, not intact, obviously change morphological changes, uh, significant morphological changes in terms of height uh, or um, thickness, thickness and border of the RP, but the RP is present. So uh, these are um, sections from um, uh, one of the Stargard eye where we used uh, the top section are just control. So there is no primary in those uh, sections because we wanted to know what's the background. Um, and the um, um, bottom section comes from um, uh, a control eye on the left and Stargard eye on the right where we use an antibody against MAC protein. And uh, as um, it's shown on the control, MAC primarily deposit on the choroid endothelia. And it's pretty well um, um, deposit around those um, endothelia. In the Stargard eye, and this is a perimacular region, and clearly there is a lot of disruption. The RP cells are a little wider, in some cases with totally missing some of the cells. MAC deposit uh, um, sort of immediately in the basal lateral of the RPE. Brooks membrane is pretty thickened, thickened compared to the control. Also, probably some of the layers are dispersed and contains this uh, MAC proteins. But what's interesting, some of the RPE also points out to have uh, internalized some of this MAC. In the peripheral area where we do maintain this monolayer in both control <coughs> and the Stargard, um, we've been able to quantify that. And the diagram, the graph um, bar shows about um, 1.5 fold increase in this MAC. And this comes from three independent Stargard um, eyes, so measurements that we've done from all of them and we average. So C3 activity, we measure by looking at uh, using an antibody against C3 protein. Again, top section um, <coughs> come from the premium, so secondary antibody. And the second sections are a stain for, with the, um, uh, an antibody against C3. And the control eye shows very minimal deposition of C3 fragments internalizing the RP, and on the right, and this is a perimacular region, we can see a small drusen in this particular eye, but you could clearly um, um, observe significant more deposition of C3 fragments as we've shown in the Stargard model. In the peripheral area, um, the C3 seems to be higher, there is a lot of background. This had to be, there is a lot of pigment. It's, it's not easy to deal with eyes that weren't quite uh, processed for a proper immunohistochemistry. They had different uh, fix like it that we normally do. But nonetheless, we've been able to, to quantify this as well. Complement factor H is mentioned earlier. It's one of the major fluid phase. It's secreted by the RPE. And um, here we show that um, in this particular section of the Stargard eyes, although the cells are present, they don't really secrete or um, stain for complement factor H that much, whereas other cells do have. So there is a lot of heterogeneity depending on what stage the cell, you know, um, it's found at that given time. Complement factor H was also quantified in the peripheral area from only two Stargard eyes, so we are still in process of acquiring data for this, and <coughs> it's shown to be significantly increased. So to summarize this part of the, um, the talk using the Stargard eye donors, similar to AMD, we've seen increased C3, C3 fragments deposit or internalized by the RPE, and MAC deposit on the RPE cells. 
And this suggests that complement this regulation is also an important etiologic factor in Stargard pathogenesis. So, so far, we kind of correlated the I don't know study with what we've seen in the mouse. But to get a closer um, look at the real human um, RP uh, dynamic of um, complement um, activity, we, um, we took the step to generate an iPS-derived RP cells from Stargard patients. And here we had much more um, control um, over selecting patients that we knew they have mutations in ABCA4 genes, and they've been also controlled for the complement-related genes. So we wanted to first study a patient that doesn't have any mutation in the complement to estimate the, um, the contribution of this gene mutation in the RP to trigger complement dysregulation. And this is basically the team that contributed to that. Our collaborator, Dr. Michael Gorin, collected the fibroblasts. We have the Eli Broad stem cells at UCLA. Dr. Karumbaya it's, uh, uh, induced the um, fibroblasts to uh, create the pluripotent stem cells. We had <clears throat> three lines for independent patients. We generated three clones from each of the line and they've been screened to the ground in my lab to make sure that the development and, uh, um, of the RP cells is normal, with the exception of ABC4, so we can um, estimate what's the effect, downstream effect and complement uh, um, reactivity in those cells. So we've analyzed, and I'm not gonna show uh, data from the characterization, I'll show some of those data in the, clin in the research seminar, just because that's very key for the role of ABCA4 in the RP. So here, what I'm showing, it's um, buildup of autofluorescence in a dish. So this is a key pathological marker for, hallmarker for Stargard model in the human eye and also Stargard mouse models. And um, this is generated in a dish. There is no particular things. The cells are grown on a, you know, optimized condition. They have minimal retinal extract in some case or no retinal extract till three months and the retinal extract was provided for later um, on age-dependent study. So this is key. So this happened in a cell that um, lacks or have this mutation of ABCA4, and we know the protein is very low abundant or non-functional. So this autofluorescence builds up over time. So we had this um, culture up to a study up to 12 months. So it initiates at three months, but by 12 months, it's significantly higher in Stargard. Complement C3, as I'm showing in this uh, confocal images, it's strongly deposited on those cells, Stargard cells, compared to the control. And um, complement uh, regulatory protein, CD46, which uh, is uh, acting early in the complement cascade, and it's um, homologue with that CRRY, it's strongly, it's significantly um, decreased. And we quantify those complement protein. We quantify CD46 and we quantify the C3 deposition and you can see the inverse correlate. So more activation of the complement, uh, it's, it, it's confirmed by less controlling of this activation by having um, <coughs> reduced level of the CD46. So how about MAC? These are flat mounts of our culture cells, and we use uh, antibody um, against MAC, and it's depicted in red, and uh, without any quantification, it's clear that this um, reactivity is stronger in the Stargard cell control, uh, compared to control. We did quantify its evidence of three months old, and it's much more um, um, evidence at 12 months in culture. So 
what happens having this ongoing activation of the complement? Well, cellular integrity is lost. And here we use a marker for phalloidin. TAPI stands for nuclei. The uh, Stargardt cell starts to lose their um, uh, nicely arrangements. It's cobblestone, no more hexagonal um, um, appearance. And there is cell that. And that impacts, and we show that we measure the um, loss of cellular integrity, of course, creates loss in trans resistance epithelium. Um, trans epithelial resistance, that means the integrity of the tight junction are um, not longer in place. The, um, the uh, transport of the solutes from basal apical is completely lost. and Cell uh, that happens because we quantified the cell number in a dish and we show that Stargard um, culture have lower number. So that's the summary for our disease in a dish. Um, clear this model, red capitulate key phenotypic features that we've seen in human disease. We've seen increased autofluorescence. We've seen complement dysregulation and age-dependent uh, cell loss. And I certainly advocate for this uh, model to be used for you know, understanding mechanism and also developing some therapeutic approaches because they truly recapitulate key um, features of the human disease. Um, what is the clinical significance and concluding remark? Well, as I said at the end of this talk, I hope I convince all of you that a complement system is dysregulated in Stargard, uh, like we knew in AMD. And I uh, will, uh, a second point that I'm making here, Stargard is a true RP cell autonomous disease. We think this is the uh, initial cell target RP declining function, loss of RP cells will eventually lead to photoreceptor cell death. It may, may not be uh, true for all the AMD cases, but certainly AMD cases that do manifest with mutation in ABC4 genes and some in the complement genes may be also uh, an uh, RPE uh, autonomous disease. Therapeutic approaches for Stargard and other ABCA4 uh, mutated uh, retinopathy, I think, should definitely gear towards RP cells along with the uh, photoreceptors. And um, giving the preclinical testing of the complement um, modulatory um, pathway in our um, mouse system with the <coughs> AAV uh, gene therapy <coughs> suggests that this particular um, approach may be beneficial for Stargard and AMD. So I um, would like to acknowledge my students, postdoc staff, uh, and I highlighted um, the people who actually generated the data that I've shown you now. Tamara Lenis was uh, um, a graduate student in my lab. She's also an ISTAR resident, so she's finalizing her residency this year and move on to her um, uh, new stage of career. Um, she worked on uh, the AV gene therapy approach in the mouse. Narmin Kadi, postdoctoral in the um, lab, she's actually the one who perform all the characterization of the IPS-derived uh, RP cells. Um, Zichun Zhang is my um, staff research associate. I've got Jane Ho, who is the, an amazing um, research associate that uh, developed this uh, tissue culture in uh, fetal human RP tissue culture in uh, Dean Bok lab. And um, my collaborator for this part of um, study that I show you today, and of course I have to acknowledge my former mentors, uh, Dean Bob and Travis, for introducing me to all this exciting uh, areas of studies that I'm pushing forward now independently. 
And thank you very much for your attention, and I'll be happy to take any questions. Thank you. Uh, we have some questions here. Yes. Well, that was a really impressive talk. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Um, so I was wondering what you think the next step would be to try to develop a therapy uh, for star guards using focusing on the complement system, you know, what would be the next experiments to do or things to try? That's a good question. I think it's still, so the way I look now, having this um, uh, amount of data on complement, um, Stargard is not longer a simple disease. So I truly view this more like uh, AMD. It is complex because we um, identify this three independent pathway. One, it involves this recycling of retinoids that builds up uh, uh, dimers of vitamin A, and one involves this complement, this regulation. So I, I envision that therapeutics uh, will benefit from having combination um, um, intervention. It can be one or the other. Each of them will provide some rescue. But at what level and how, it is hard to say because each individual will come with a particular genotype, and each genotype will impact the level of this disruption of the RPE functionality. So what is new, we certainly like to um, evaluate some of those complement modulators in the, in the human um, IPS cells. We're not quite there yet, because we also found that there are other uh, protein aggregates that we've done some proteomics. Those are still preliminary data. But it, those may be also mounting this complement activation. Maybe this retina is just part of the conventional pathway, but maybe something else, other disruption uh, along this endolysosomal processing of Anything that comes, whether from the apical side or basolateral, they all have to be processed by RP. And endolysosomal um, organelles, it's where we focus right now. So the new graduate student actually it's evaluating some of the um, catepsin D mediated processes, and we're going to have some preliminary data at ARVO. So that's something new. And the other aspect, because I I mean, ever since we had that profile of negative regulatory complement in an early stage of the mouse eye where they are very low abundant, I was like, how could that happen? Is this because RP just cannot really synthesize those as a consequence of the lack of or <coughs> mutated ABCA4? in retrospective now thinking, because we have the, the news of ABC4 being expressing the RP, or is a consequence of buildup and consequence of complement uh, activity uh, internalized fragments in the RP that eventually decline this ability of RP to synthesize. So we don't know that, and that's somehow we keen to understand early processes rather than go to the end point where the cell is filled with stuff, okay, that you cannot really dissect out anything because they definitely internalize, and that ought to impact across the board all those functions that I mentioned at the beginning. Greg. A wonderful presentation, Roxanne. Thank you, Greg. Um, we've given a lot of thought lately to this concept that in, in macular dystrophies, whether mm -hmm. they're monogenic or something like star guards, a lot of interest in how do AMD chromosome 1 and chromosome 10 risk alleles influence these monogenic mm -hmm. diseases like star guards. Are you aware of any data out there that I am not. I am not. I wish I do. I know that's a big, uh, big um, question now, and I will be interested. I thought you might be able to enlighten me a bit about those 
Well, you would guess that somebody that's mm -hmm. homozygous for risk at, say, chromatin, right. or H, mm -hmm. locus, and carries Starbert's mutations, right. you, would, you would assume that the pathology would be... Definitely, and that was... Uh, you know, that was part of a very old application that I tried to put out there, like looking at in, you know, select, but we don't have the resources. That was the biggest issue, is like having a cohort of people who uh, will, ma will have mutation in ABCA4 and have a normal um, or protective um, uh, haplotype for AMD and have a cohort of people that uh, have mutation of AMD a mutation of ABCA4, but on a risk haplotype, and I'm still interested in that. We do have some of those um, risk haplotype and protective haplotype from DIN collection, the fetal human RPE. But if you do have such eyes with this type of genotype in your collection, I'll be more than happy to to evaluate some of those markers that we we did with complement biochemical markers that. But uh, uh, more than fetal human RPE haven't been genotyped for ABCA4. And we genotyped some of those that we knew the haplotype for AMD risk and protective. And as expected, our, uh, so we did six of them, six of each haplotype for AMD. And out of six, um, four didn't have any mutations in ABCA4, as expected, and two did have some mutation, but are not really. One, it's um, possible disease-causing mutation, so they weren't quite appealing to us to push forward of looking at this correlate, if that uh, answered your question. But it's a very interesting question. It's definitely something that I would... Uh, be interested to. The IPS derived cell that I show you, they are on a um, uh, protective haplotype, so they don't have uh, the uh, YY, uh, they don't have the uh, 406 and 62. And were you able to genotype the four donors? Yes, yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, so with the Stargard patient, we did full genotype. Actually, uh, Dr. Gordon has done this for all the AMD genes. And I requested for Stargard because I was interested to know exactly what, not just being clinically diagnosed as Stargard, I wanted to know what is the mutation. Because as I mentioned, this particular um, um, uh, cell culture, we use it for two reasons. One, to, uh, again, look for expression of ABC4 like another system that it's devoid of contamination of the outer segment to look for the expression of ABCA4 and test the function of ABCA4 in the RP, okay? So that was key for us to know what mutation it has and what's the protein expression there and how does it work. And this is the part that I'm gonna talk at the noon seminar. So it was a pretty good uh, um, model for us. And then, of course, complement was the other pathway that we thought it's worth looking. Okay. All right. Hopefully well, you can come to the after the noon hopefully. seminar. Yeah. And, uh, I know everyone needs to move on. And thank you very much. It's very exciting. And this is translational. We are involved in one clinical study now looking at complement inhibitor C5 inhibitor intravitreally with Stargard disease. So our work is already being translated. Thank you. Thank you.